Hello, everyone, and welcome to Janky to the Max, a podcast where we talk about incredible creations and the even more inspiring creators who make them. Uh, today on the show, we have Applied Ion, who is a little bit of a rocket scientist. Um, before we get to that, uh, there's a few things. Uh, first off, uh, starting April 10th, there will be Jack is hosting a game jam. Um, hurts pretty big. It's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be 10 days. Um, and we'll be building games and, and having a blast. Uh, next up, we got, uh, if you, um, uh, are listening to this through Spotify or Pocket Cast, wherever you get your podcast, um, join us on Discord. Uh, we stream all of these live. You can sit in, ask questions. We'll probably get to them. Um, yeah. And, uh, let's see. I know I'm, oh, gosh, why do I always wait till the end? <laughs> and of course, there's Glavin, my amazing co host. Hey, hey. <laughs> Save the best for last. Yes. That's it. That's it. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so welcome to the show, Applied Iron. Glad you could be here. Oh, thank you very much for, for having me. Really excited to be here. Oh, no, it's great. So tell, tell us what, what are you working on? What, what do you do? Um, yeah. So, so currently, um, for, for those who, who don't know my work, uh, I'm working on, uh, open source electric propulsion for micro and nano satellites. Uh, so really focusing on, uh, plasma and ion thrusters for these small satellites. Um, so I've, I've been working on uh, several different technologies across the board for these. Um, a lot of it geared for, for pocket cubes, um, cause currently there isn't really any propulsion out there for pocket cubes, as well as kind of scaling up a little bit larger for, for cube, cube set class satellites. Mm hmm. Well, and, and yeah, a little bit of explanation. Um, so CubeSats, pocket satellites, they're just really tiny satellites, like 11 inches, right? Uh, 11, yeah, very, very small. So cube, CubeSats are, uh, the standard for that is about a 10 centimeter cube per block, so like a 1U CubeSat is 10 by 10 by 10, and then you know, 2U is you know, two of those together. And then going even smaller, pocket cubes, uh, which are kind of the newest addition to the, to the satellite world, um, are our 5 centimeter cube standard. So even even much smaller, a quarter, wow. quarter of the volume of a CubeSat, so a lot less space to work with, a lot less power to work with, making making it very cheap to, to launch, um, but also there's some unique challenges that come with it. I like what were some of those challenges you you faced? Uh well for me personally, uh for propulsion, since electric propulsion um primarily performance is based on, on electric power, how much you have. Um since these tiny satellites have very little power, it's it's extremely difficult to um try to optimize the, the thrusters to get as much thrust and specific impulse and everything as possible on these really small scales and then kind of just in general with spacing um scaling the technology down so that it actually fits in these incredibly small volumes right right because uh um yeah you you i, I can't even begin to imagine how hard it would be trying to um yeah trying to scale everything down to that 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 small uh so uh like just uh, for the the listeners who don't know, can you give a brief outline uh, outline of uh, of ion propulsion or no, not ion propulsion? Um, gosh, electric propulsion. What what did you call it? Yeah, electric propulsion. Um, so it's pretty much you you have two major set. Well, there's a few major sets of propulsion for space. You have obviously the chemical propulsion where you have um, some chemical reaction. That produces, you know, huge amounts of thrust, like actual rocket engines or, or bipropellant engines, um, at very low efficiencies. And then on the other side, you have electric propulsion, which uses electric power to uh, generate thrust, either in the form of um, ions, so charged particle beams, um, generating small amounts of thrust, or plasma, either through plasma heating, like RF um, plasmas or pulse plasma systems, to generate that thrust. Um, so. At that scale, you're talking about very, very low thrust levels, like micronewtons or, or uh, millinewtons of thrust, but extremely high efficiencies. So you can run them um, for much longer on much less fuel, and, and especially in space when you're going for long-duration um, flights, 
you, you want to have more efficient fuel usage just because you're, you're, the, the mass that you can carry and the amount of volume you have is, is very limited. Um, so there's trade-offs between the two, uh, but electric propulsion has a lot of um, unique advantages to it. Um, so really, really all, they're, they're pretty much just basically either ion guns or, or plasma sources strapped to the back of satellites. And, and uh, that's what kind of what it boils down to. Did you specialize in, in ion propulsion or is it just uh, like you, you do both depending on what whatever I, satellite you're working on? I, I have no formal training in, in um, electric propulsion myself. A lot of my background, though, is um, in high voltage systems. Um, I've done a lot of just research in general on my own and, and plasma systems and particle beam systems and you know now working at a particle accelerator um, everything both career wise and um, hobby kind of all ties together um, so vacuum systems that go to support running these types of thrusters and and you know ion optics and, and all these other things kind of merge together so it's a it's a field I think that um, you can definitely get a degree in um, specializing in propulsion, but I think it's very it's it's so multidisciplinary that you can draw from all different types of fields. Um, like there's there's thrusters that work electric propulsion thrusters that work on electrospray of particles. There's thrusters that work with uh, plasmas and and traditional ions ion beams. So there's there's a whole bunch of different areas that, that can merge into this. Um, yeah. That you can, well, t tell, yeah. Us, tell us more about like kind of a bit of your background and like how, how you got here, because I know, I know a lot of us are like huge space nerds. Like we, we, we all love space. Um, and, but like they're, they're always, at least for me, there always seems to be like this barrier, like, okay, well, if you're even going to think about like working on stuff, you know, you have to have a you know, degree in, in, you know, in, in rocket science, you know, that, that sort of stuff, but you've taken like a different route. So kind of tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, really this, this started a couple of years ago. I mean, for, for the longest time, um, and I've been interested in high voltage systems and I've, I've done a whole bunch of different projects with high voltage and, and plasmas and atmospheric conditions. Um, but I've always wanted to get into vacuum-based plasma physics. So there's a lot of really cool things you can do in vacuum, but that requires, you know, va high vacuum system to use. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of years ago, I kind of just buckled down and, and you know, started um, designing and, and budgeting it out for, for a very simple vacuum system using, um, you know, whatever spare surplus parts are, are on eBay and, and trading with friends who are in the, in the field and everything that, that do this um, themselves. And originally my goal wasn't electro propulsion. I was actually looking to build uh, my own special type of um, very high power electron gun. Um, so I had, I had started doing that um, and gearing up for that. And um, in, in the process of designing the systems and, and talking with others and, and friends and stuff who also kind of do vacuum physics stuff at home, um, I found that I had some extra surplus parts and I figured, uh, what else is cool that you can do in vacuum? And propulsion has always kind of been another side interest of mine. Um, everything from, from pulse jets and, and small hybrid rockets, um, and, and um, turbocharger-based jet engines. None of the stuff I actually built, but it was always really cool to see that stuff in in the maker community and seeing what other people are building at home. And electric propulsion kind of was a way to merge my interests in high voltage and plasma and particle beams and propulsion. And I thought, you know, hey, might as well try doing this on the side. Um, so as I kept so as I kept going and talking more with people in the in the community about this. Um, my interest kind of shifted a lot more into the propulsion side. There was a lot um, of excitement within the uh, maker community about it, and there really wasn't anyone actually doing this stuff yet at this level. So I kind of transitioned more and more into this and uh, working more with the pocket cube community um, kind of grew into this role of, of, of being Maybe, the guy who's doing the open source yeah. propulsion. Yeah, so that's another really cool thing is that it's all open source, right? Yeah, yeah, everything. Uh, you can go to my website. You can you can actually find 
um, for, for the thrusters that actually complete and, and work, because there's, there's a lot more failures than there are successes, but for the stuff mm -hmm. that actually does work, um, you can find, you know, the, the, all the, the schematics, the CAD, the PCB models. Um, I have test reports, videos, articles about all the stuff, so I document everything very heavily and just release it, um, because right now, um, propulsion, it's a, it's a very, niche and, and, and closed field. There's there's tons and tons of papers you can get from academia, but it's not really open source in the sense that you can actually do it yourself directly from the information that they give you. Mm -hmm. And it's also very extremely costly. Um, so right. I wanted to do it in ways that were available with very limited tooling that I had myself. That is, that is incredible, man. Like, good, like, Kudos for, for pushing through and, and doing that because, I mean, yeah, that's, that, that is incredible. So when you, when you say you build these engines, like how much of it do you build? Um, I mean, as in, do you design everything from like the, like the, I don't know, like casing to the, um, yeah, like, like what, like do you, do you just from the ground up or do you maybe get a few things off the shelf? or experiment like what's your process like yeah everything everything is pretty much from the ground up because again at the scale that i'm going at um so primarily pocket cubes the really the smallest size satellite that can actually theoretically support propulsion um there, there isn't really anything out there i think there's maybe a couple of institutes that have done maybe a resistor jet or a pulse plasma thruster besides myself but other than that there's almost nothing in literature at this scale um so really Everything from the engine itself to the electronics um, are, are done from the ground up. And of course, there's there's parts and stuff I have to buy. Um, like there's there's um, really nice micro high voltage supplies from like Emco or Pico Electronics that I can get from DigiKey or from the companies. And um, certain things like uh, um, the current electro spray thruster I'm working on, which uses a porous glass emitter for the ion emitter. I'm getting that machined at a special um, CNC glass fabrication place. Um, but other than that, everything else is, is that, that is still fully designed myself um, with whatever software I have available, free software for um, field simulations or circuitry or thermal or whatever. Um, so yeah, everything really has to be not only designed from the ground up, but designed again in a way that I can do it. Uh, myself. Um, so like mm -hmm. the very first thrusters that I worked on, the pulse plasma thrusters, um, those were literally just um, copper and Teflon plates stacked together and bolted together with non-conductive peak bolts. And everything was cut and drilled on the table with a hand drill and a Dremel and, and put together and then pulsed uh, externally with some very old tube-based power supplies. Um, wow. So everything, yeah, everything has to be able to be done as much as possible at home and then you know, exporting some of the specialized machining to, to places that have the tooling for that. But still doing it in a way that um, I can actually afford that machining. So yeah. definitely a lot of... Uh, yeah, because, because uh, um, like how, how much would uh, like an average, I guess it's a bad question, but like how much would an average... Like, like an iteration cost compared, yeah. Um, like, so really, like right now, uh, if you want to get an idea of how absurdly expensive propulsion is on the market, um, it depends on on the propulsion. And I'll I'll just focus on on like the micro satellite class thrusters, electric thrusters. Um, but for like a pulse plasma thruster, um, that usually st that's one of the cheaper ones that starts usually around $25,000 for a CubeSat based model. And then for micro ion thrusters, usually these are electro spray. So either um, ionic liquid or liquid metal fuel. Um, these start around 40,000. And then for, you know, the bigger, more classic thrusters that, that are, people usually associate, like the Hall effect thrusters or the gridded ion thrusters, those range you know, typically hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so mm -hmm. at the scale that I'm working at, um, we're talking, you know, the electronics um, for the thruster that's actually 
currently in Spain being integrated on a couple of pocket cubes now, uh, the GPPT3. Um, the electronics for that, I think, were maybe three or four hundred dollars. And then the <laughs> for the actual thruster was, uh, you know, it's just very thin one eighth inch copper plate and one eighth inch thick um, Teflon. So very, very cheap in terms of materials and electronics. So, um, Less than, less than, much less than a thousand dollars total for that particular thruster. Um, the new thruster that I'm working on, which is uh, an advanced electrospray thruster that uses um, room temperature molten salts, that one's a little bit more expensive because I have to get the the glass machining, um, and and you know the fuel is is a couple hundred dollars, um, but still you know you can get it from chemistry suppliers. So that one's maybe in, on the order between one to two thousand dollars, but still. The whole goal is, you know, over an order magnitude reduction in price yeah, compared to what's no currently kidding. out there. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know what? What I, what I absolutely love about, especially open sourcing space stuff, is that um, I, I don't know if you guys, any of you, listen to Malcolm Gladwell. If you haven't, I would recommend his podcast and his books. They're fantastic. But anyways, one of the things he was he was uh, making noticing or a theory he was stating, was uh, one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain was because there were more skilled craftsmen. And the reason why that's important is that uh, technological advancement isn't necessarily a star game. It's not where you have a few key players and they kind of run, you know, they run the court. Um, instead, uh, technological advancement is about having the most amount of people who are skilled and can have the ability to like work on a thing, right? And so I think that if, if we can, as we can um, bring like space technology, you know, I love about the CubeSat movement and, and what you're doing right here is that it, it's bringing it down so that, um, you know, people, people like us can, you know, make some, make some improvements and, and tinker with it. And I don't know, I, I think that's just really cool what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one well, like one of the things that like, my goals for this is is really showing um, people in the hobbyist community that, um, especially for in particular for this area, um, you don't need the traditionally millions of dollars um, to do this stuff. You don't need a PhD to do this stuff. Um, you don't need you know ten twenty years to make a system that you know fires in vacuum or even goes in space. Um, like I said, there's a huge um, community of do-it-yourself vacuum physicists out there um, all around the world. There's a great Discord channel called Vacuum Hackers where tons of people from around the world gather and do everything from home semiconductors uh, to home plasma physics, neutron sources, and, and now electric propulsion. Um, so the stuff, the, the infrastructure to be able to support this is, is quite readily available, especially in the U.S. There's tons of surplus of vacuum equipment for very cheap. And a lot of the principles, um, and when you think rocket science and, and, you know, maybe electric propulsion, it might seem intimidating or, or kind of very difficult to access. But, um, if you, if you kind of look at some of the thrusters and stuff I've done, like the pulse plasma thrusters, it's like for that one in general, it's literally just Teflon and copper just stacked together. Um, the principles and mathematics and physics and stuff behind it, it's, it's good to ha know the, the fundamentals and everything. And honestly, math is, is one of my worst subjects, but um, it doesn't actually take that much effort to, to get these simple materials just um, operating and showing the basic principles. Yeah. Um, so. And, and the, and the more, the more we, the more people, the more, um, the more people are working in this are making this open source that are, you know, paving the way makes it easier for even more people to go along and, and, and may, may work on their own, their own section. Yeah. That's just, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and I, th I think an important thing, um, like how, how long, uh, say, say your, your best engine, how long can you, uh, keep the satellite in orbit? Because isn't that, isn't that the, the purpose to help? 
uh, decrease the amount. Yeah, of that the is radius. the goal. Um, the, the first thrust, the complete thruster that I build with the the electronics and thruster and everything, the GPVT three that's that's currently supposedly going in orbit by the end of June. Um, that one we actually found there there really isn't at the um, the altitude that it's going to be at. There isn't going to be really enough thrust to actually do uh, orbit maintenance. So. Uh, at different levels of, of orbit, there's different requirements, and the higher up you go, um, the, the amount of thrust you need drops off quite radically because of atmospheric drag conditions and all that other stuff. So mm -hmm. for the current one that's that's out there, um, that one's going to be more of a tech demo, but it'll be uh, an important tech demo because um, if it actually works and we verify ignition, uh, it'll be the first time that this class of satellite has ever fired propulsion successfully in orbit. And it's really, you know, the first time that an open source home built thruster is actually fired in orbit. Is, um, so is, the current one I is, feel like that is a huge, giant achievement. Like, yes, putting a man in space is important, and putting man on the moon is, is also pretty cool. But, like, having an open source that someone built in their garage, not like a, a team of trained rocket scientists in a lab, like, I don't know. It's, that, that's just, that, that, that is. That is, that is amazing. I, yeah, I think it would be, the I, whole mission, I think, would be a really great win for the open source and, and do yourself community because it's a it's a really international collaboration between a whole bunch of open um, communities. So there's myself providing the thruster. There's AMSAT Spain, um, who's doing, their, their group uh, is doing the actual CubeSats themselves. And then there's Libraspace, uh, the Libra Space Foundation and FOSSA Systems who are doing the deployers. So all these open groups are coming together for this um, one mission and, and doing something quite advanced, I think, for the Pocket Cube um, group in, in, in general. So it would be a really fantastic thing if everything works out. Ah, no kidding. That wait, when, And when is that? When is that scheduled to launch? Um, for now, as if there's no delays with the current situation going on, I believe it's scheduled for June 30th or around around the end of June, I believe. Uh, so we'll be okay, finding that, out hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, that will be something we'll have to we'll have to mark somehow because that's that that is such a huge achievement. I I'm I'm so happy right now. Oh gosh, it's, that's 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 incredible. Um, so where, where do you think, uh, what are your goals like for coming up as far as, um, like, what, or you just want to keep working on, um, making like the, the engine smaller? Are you, are you thinking about once you, you know, like a pocket satellite, you're going to go out bigger for one larger, try to make this cheaper? Yeah. So, so one of my goals is really first off you know, tackling you know, all the various forms of electric propulsion out there. Um, so. Um, for the current ones, the pulse plasma thrusters, um, they work, but there's still a lot of issues with them. So still getting the reliability up, um, for that class and then expanding into new areas like the electro spray. Um, I've got that thruster currently in the works. Um, I did start sketching out some new designs, um, just recently for, for an, uh, iodine fueled gridded, um, ion engine. So one of the more traditionally um, higher powered and, and quite expensive systems um, I'm looking to, to take down to this level as well. Um, that one's going to be a little bit higher power, where the previous ones were a few watts. Um, the, the gridded ion one is going to be on the uh, 50 watt or so level of power. Mm -hmm. um, but really branching out into different forms of electric propulsion and... Um, I started out with the, the pocket cube, not only because there really wasn't any propulsion out there for it, but um, scaling in electric propulsion is, is one of the biggest challenges. Going smaller is much harder than going larger. So I figure, you know, start out as small as possible, work out the bugs for that, and then going up larger is, is easier, especially with some of these thrusters like electrospray, where the actual physical thruster doesn't get bigger. Um, what you do usually is you parallel a lot of modules together, um, kind of as a cluster to give you higher thrust for, for larger ones. So working out the smaller ba building blocks. And then, um, you know, if you want to put it on a larger satellite, you just parallel, you know, five or 10 of them together. 
Okay. Right on. So I got a question real quick. So about the runtime for these engines, um, what kind of total runtime do they tend to have? And can you use its maximum cap capability all at once, or can you only have limited amount per application of force? Um, so you, it, runtime, again, really is, is highly dependent on the technology. Um, so if we, if we look I mean, at the more for the ones general, that you've been getting into. Um, certain, certain thrusters, you know, like the gridded ions can last. You know, I think the, the most recent tests with the newest one from NASA, they just completed like 40 or 50,000 hours of runtime continuous. Um, so some really absurd numbers for the biggest ones. And then, at the CubeSat level, you're talking about, you know, several thousand hours of runtime um, for, for ion engines and then for like pulse plasma thrusters and stuff. They're, they're, since they're, they're pulsed, it really is more on, you know, how many pulses they last. So on the order of usually about a million pulses or so. Um, so for the ones that I'm looking at, um, they're, they, they do last uh, quite a bit less, um, just based on the, the scaling that I'm going even smaller and, and simpler, um, kind of as entry level stuff. So, so the recent pulse plasma thruster, it was on the order of a thousand pulses, but that's more because, um, the main capacitor bank that deals with the, the discharge, um, it's very difficult to find capacitors that can, can that can handle those currents at, at this small scale. And then um, going into the other stuff like the electro spray, currently that has a lifetime of about maybe 800 hours in the field, and I haven't actually tested mine yet. So, so the goals will be to bring it up, you know, to 10 10 hours of runtime, qualify that, then bring it to 100 hours, and then kind of pushing it forward a little bit each time. So that really tries to push the limits of getting maximum fuel efficiency for how small of amount of fuel you can fit in a CubeSat on top of all the other equipment that is actually supposed to be in that CubeSat for it to do its job. Um, about how much fuel do you actually, are you carrying in these, uh, in these small CubeSats? Um, although that's one of the nice things about electric propulsion is that you can use a small amount of fuel and get away with uh, very long run times. Again, the trade-off is um, for the same amount of, like, if you're raising the orbit of a satellite, if you're using electric propulsion versus chemical propulsion, it'll take, um, you know, on the order of months to achieve the same thr um, change in, in, in orbit as opposed to a chemical thruster that would probably take on the order of, you know, hours or maybe a day or so. So there's a trade-off between you know, how fast you're going to move and, um, how much space and, and fuel you have. Uh, so so even though th there are a lot of fuel efficiency benefits, you still have to kind of look at the mission context and what you're, you're after um, in regards. So it's in, in some sense, electric propulsion isn't for every single mission. It's not like, you know, the, 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 the solution to everything. So it really depends. But um, so for like these micro thrusters for um, CubeSats, um, if you're looking at stuff like electro spray and pulse plasma thruster, your thrusters, you're really looking at tiny amounts of fuel on the order of maybe like grams or so, because for certain, these thrusters, um, they're, they're stored, um, often in either solid or liquid form. Um, for the larger thrusters, like the, the ones, this, the, the smaller gridded ion and, and hull and RF plasma ones that use traditional like xenon tanks, those take up a, those take up obviously a lot more room, but for some of the stuff that's scaling even smaller, um, there's there's a lot less fuel that it's actually required for the same amount of total runtime. All right. So now another thing I know you, that you mentioned was talking about using tra the difficulty of energy storage solutions. So you said you're using capacitors at the time being. Can you tell us a little bit more about what goes into the energy storage part and why, how, how much energy you're needing all at once and why that's so important? Yeah, so that, the, in terms of energy storage, that, that's again dependent on the type of thruster. Not every thruster is going to be using some sort of bank or storage. 
um, really that that deals with with the pulse thrusters. So either um, the pulse plasma thrusters or vacuum arc thrusters, where they either use um, stored energy in capacitors or inductors. Um, for for the pulse plasma thrusters, one of the big lifetime limits, just in general, is the pulse capacitors, because you're dealing with um, pulse currents on the order of hundreds to thousands of amps. And um, that puts a lot of stress on these capacitors, especially with things like ringing and, and, and just other issues in general, and coupling that into a tiny space. Um, like, for example, the pulse plasma thruster that I built, that the whole board is about a 40 millimeter square. Um, so that has the high voltage supplies on it, that has the pulse capacitor, that has the thruster and controls and everything on it. Um, so I don't actually have that much room for a lot of capacitors. Uh, for, for a larger CubeSat model, um, one of the things to overcome this limit is paralleling lots of capacitors together. So that way you distribute how much energy is delivered from each so you can get longer lifetimes or for even bigger ones you can use more conventional larger capacitors that, that are easier to make more robust. Um, so for this scale stored energy is, is quite challenging just from the technological standpoint that it's it's difficult to have capacitors and stuff that, that last for this for like hundreds of thousands or even millions of pulses at, at this size. Um, for other thrusters in, in terms of high voltage supplies in general, um, it becomes a challenge from from the standpoint of you know getting you know thousands of volts on a on a very small board and then doing it efficiently as well. Um, I think the, th the supplies I'm using for like the electro spray are maybe a little bit less than 80 percent efficient um, just because of the scale the scaling and how, how the high voltage is generated just at this size, it's difficult to get super high efficiencies. Um, I can imagine. And, and in particular, one of the, the, the biggest challenge I'm finding with this current thruster is, is switching. I have to switch um, plus and minus 3.5 3 kV onto the load um, and alternate between the two. And um, it's challenging to actually switch these voltages at, at this size. So I'm running into some issues actually with, with the current technology that's available, but it's, it's still, it's still progressing slowly. So we're, we're getting there. <laughs> right on. So another um, thing that kind of comes into play. So you say with, with having such limited energy storage, um, when you've done a uh, propulsion maneuver, obviously it's going to take time to recharge that capacitor what kind of recharge time or what kind of limitations do you have on time between uh, thrust maneuvers to be able to recharge? Um, in, for, for electric propulsion, since, since uh, the maneuvers are spread out uh, on the order of you know, weeks or even months, it's more a limit of what the actual satellite can provide continuously for propulsion. So if the, if the, satellite has a budget of one watt of power for the propulsion system, um, that's really all you have to work with to to move the satellite and provide the thrust required. Um, so, like for the pulse plasma thrusters, a single pulse really isn't going to do much. It's, a, it's more of a continuous train of pulses that are applied over a very long time. And usually that's, you know, fired, you know, maybe once a second or so. So the recharge times, even at these low powers, are pretty small, but you have to fire it many, many times to actually get somewhere. All right, gotcha. So, like, that's kind of another question, leads into the next question I had of uh, you talking about having huge amounts of current uh, for very short periods of time in this unit. Um, and, we, you know, we all think that, you know, the vacuum of space, well, everything's freezing cold out there, but really... You only have one means of heat dissipation, that's through radiation. Do you have any difficulties with thermal, or any thermal limitations with, like, being able to thermally dissipate heat? Um, for, for the thrusters that I've been working on, that's actually not really an issue. The pulse plasma thrusters, um, typically when they're firing, you know, once a second or even, even slower for the ones that I've done at, you know, a few microsecond long pulses, the heating really isn't that much of an issue, and the electrospray stuff actually generates really no heat. 
at all, just because of the, the ion emission process is, is a pretty cold process. Um, but for other thrusters, like if I were to um, do the, the iodine-fueled gridded ion thruster, um, then you have a lot of issues with heat because uh, the ion source is actually a bulk plasma inside the discharge chamber. So you have to um, you have to contain the plasma in, inside the, the chamber and then extract the ions from that. And you know the plasmas get very hot, and, and that's one of the issues, especially with with gridded ion and hall thrusters, is 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 the thermal management of, of those systems. So so for the higher power, larger thrusters, uh, thermal management is definitely more of a challenge. But for like the really small stuff um, with other technologies, it's not as big of an issue. Nice. That's, that's all the questions I had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, GM Networks asks, um, how about inertial propulsion? So I think it was going back to our conversation about uh, the, the effectiveness and, and use times of your engines. And I, I'm assuming he's asking, um, how does it work from... Yeah. Uh, so inertial propulsion in, in uh, I guess... Maybe could he elaborate a little bit more on like what he means by inertial propulsion? Because depending on who you ask, there could be different interpretations of. Uh, let, let's just go with um, like say say the satellite's being or orbiting Earth, and oh wait, he has a. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, I got you. A little bit. Girl, like, like, are you talking about like solar sail type, or are you talking about? Uh... I don't know, did, what exactly? Uh, he's typing. <laughs> Hold on. Um, shifting weight around, okay. So, like, orienting the satellite? Um, so, I guess, for, for well, at least in, in terms of inertial for orienting the satellite, I mean, there's obviously, like, reaction wheels that that do do a lot of that, um, using, using the inertia of the wheels to change the rotation, um, in terms of propulsion, uh, I'm sh sure, I know there's there's probably stuff out there, but I haven't really dealt that much with any physical inertial systems. It's it's mostly been focused on on the plasma and ion sources. Mm -hmm. and this is also kind of a neat eye opener too, seeing how it's not just you know one one type of uh, movement system covers everything, it's a whole bunch of small systems that all have to interplay together to be able to achieve a goal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, um, there's just so many different parts that, that have to work together properly. Um, and, and depending on the thruster, that could be, you know, simpler or more complex. Um, like pulse plasma thrusters, you have, you know, an igniter and an anode and a cathode, so not not really too much to it. Whereas like gridded ion thrusters, you know, you have a discharge chamber, you have multiple grids with, with different potentials for ion optics, uh, you have fuel delivery. So it can range from, from very, very simple um, passively fed stuff to, to quite complex. And then that's why it's called rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That is, that is so incredible. So, um, if, for, for those of us who might be interested in, uh, you know, getting into the small satellite, open source, small satellite field, where are some good places to get started? Um, there's, there's, there's a few resources out there, like, uh, the Libra space community is, is one that's providing open source re resources for, for the field in general. Um, I know, like, like I mentioned, FOSA Systems is, is providing um, open source resources for the actual pocket cubes and stuff themselves. Um, in terms of really the open source hardware for satellites, that, that, that area is actually um, still kind of lacking. That really requires more people to get involved. Um, like there's tons of stuff out there for open source software. There are tons of stuff out there for tracking and ground stations, there's thousands of ground stations now all over the world that you can use to track satellites yourself. Um, but in terms of the actual satellite hardware, there isn't really that much. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go to the open source CubeSat workshop that was held in Athens, Greece in October, um, which was a really fantastic event where, you know, all probably 
30 countries around the world came together to share a lot on open source CubeSats and open source space. And one of the surprising things that I took away from it was that there still really isn't that much work on open source hardware in this area. Again, there's tons of mm -hmm. stuff for software and for tracking and everything, but in terms of the actual physical satellites and subsystems, pe people really aren't sharing as much about that. Um, so I think there's that definitely a, a lot of room for people to get involved with. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. Um, yeah, so th thanks for that. So is, are there any other like personal resources you want to plug? Um, in terms in terms of for, for the satellites themselves, I mean, I, I haven't looked too much actually into the other subsystems because, you know, each subsystem itself is a, is a whole field you could get into everything from power to communication to various, you know, the infinite science payloads you can get into. Right. Um, so I do have... I, 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 I was seeing more like, yeah. a, like you got a, like a Twitter or a website or anything that oh you're yeah on yeah wanna... um so so for my stuff i post everything um primarily through the applied eye on twitter page so that's where i directly interact with the community on a daily basis and post updates i mean i have i usually when i actually every time when i run a when i run a test um i live tweet details of the tests and i've started um actually live streaming propulsion tests when they happen um, there's the applied eye on Instagram, which has all the pictures and everything, the builds and, er and all that stuff, and the applied eye on um, website where I post and document everything just in general, like all the schematics and details and everything kind of packaged and bundled together. Um, so those are kind of the, really the major, major areas that have everything. But again, everything is all there across the board. Um, and, you know, if there's any questions from anyone, um, especially, you know, on Twitter or even through email or whatever, I'm always happy to, you know, answer that about propulsion in general. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, thanks, man. That's, that, that's, that, yeah. But what you, you're, you are doing some incredible work and, uh, it's, it, it's super encouraging. Um, because, I mean, again, I think we're, we're all space nerds. We all love space. We all love the idea. And, you know, this is a, this is a practical way to, to get involved and, to actually make a difference. Oh, yeah. yes. Actually, I've done a lot of research already in electrically powered engines just for, because I write hard sci-fi, and I want it to be scientifically accurate as possible. So that's something I actually have a, a link on my desktop that goes to several pages for electrically powered engines and the different types so I can easily reference them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's great. All right. Well, I should, we should probably let you guys go. Um, anyways, uh, thanks for, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, so this is, I, I, I knew I would forget something in the beginning, but this is the start of our space month. So for the rest of the month, we're going to be talking to different people in the space industry. Um, I believe, and I haven't checked my schedule, so I'm going to have to recheck it. I believe it's Wednesday or Monday. Um, I'll post some details, but I'm going to be interviewing, uh, we're going to be talking to a uh, CEO for a space startup. So we'll get like a, um, yeah, it'll be really good, really interesting. I'm super excited for that. Um, so anyways, I uh, hope to see you guys there for that. And remember, whatever projects you're working on, keep it janky to the max. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Janky to the Max. If you like it, make sure to like the video and subscribe. And if you want to suggest more projects that we can feature, make sure to comment down below, or even better, join the Discord server in the description. We try to stream live every weekend on the server, so make sure to join and grab the podcast role if you want to be there and see it for yourself. Anyway, make sure to stay janky.